Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with the first person I had ever seen manage two or three professional tennis players and temperaments ever uh, as a tennis coach. Uh, we all know this is a sport with a lot of personalities and a lot of demands and really a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention as expected. And this man has done it for years uh, without ever looking stressed. The beard has gotten grayer over the years. <laughs> so <laughs> it's showing up in other ways, but we are here with Craig Boyden. Craig, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, buddy. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So I remember when I first met you, it was December 2015. We were in Carson and Stevie J, Sam, they're all over there banging balls at Carson against the, the big blue uh, tarps at the back. And I was over there with Sloan and every day it was like a recurring thing, right? And I was like, man, this dude is three players. And then we get to Acapulco and Sloan, we were walking on to the court to practice for the, to warm up for the, either the semi or the final. And you were walking off the court and you said to me, hey, did your mom come? And I was like, well, what, what the? Are you talking about like no mom didn't come and he, we looked at each other he's like i was like i'm not sean i'm come out he's like oh i'm so and i remember thinking to myself i shared a court with you for like six weeks <laughs> and you thought i was sean uh, you know i i'm gonna apologize now and hopefully the statutes and limitations haven't expired on the apology. <laughs> but i just want you to know that um I you're you you look really good for your age for by the way really good and that is not so much an indictment on you as it is on me so yeah. it's my fault I apologize I I and uh, but you know we were able to sustain it so and, and withstand it so I, I apologize and uh, I I have at times been uh, kind of tunnel vision especially like you said when I had two guys. And I didn't really, I wasn't great about like focusing on anything outside of my gaze. And that's a bit of a weakness. So thank you for actually pointing that out. And so now <laughs> I can be mindful about opening up my gaze and not sticking my foot in my mouth anymore. Thank you. So now, you know, it was funny. So the first six months of 2016 were funny because uh, Sloan's and I first tournament together was in Auckland and she won the title in Auckland. And I remember when they were doing the photos. You know, after you got the trophy, the right, ball right. kids and volunteers like, wait, 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 here comes her boyfriend. And then she and I look and we're like, that ain't my boyfriend. And I was like, that ain't my girlfriend. <laughs> so, so, so in January, I was the boyfriend. And in February, in Acapulco, I was the brother. So that's why I was like, man, it's just, I'm graduating. We do, we do wear a lot of hats. So, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, neither of those I wore. Yeah. But, okay. So you've, uh, you know, you've been in the game a long time, one of the most respected coaches in America. Um, tell me about how you got in the game. And at what point did you give up the game to really dedicate your life to coaching? So I played uh, in juniors and my, my, my family, my parents played. They introduced it, uh, the game to me, oddly enough, when I lived in Maine. Um, and then we moved to Florida and could play year round. So uh, I got the bug. I played. Did pretty good in juniors, uh, not great, but they did okay. Uh, quarters at Kalamazoo, so did okay. Um, played in college, and towards my my latter years in college, uh, I was a better uh, I was a better teammate to my player to to the, to my I was a better teammate like mentally um, than I was to myself. So I I kind of got the idea that. I can see someone about to go into a pothole and been able to maneuver them around it, but I couldn't do that for, with myself. And so uh, then after college, I started playing and I mean, I was decent. I was pretty good. I think I was, I could have been a lot better than I, than I was, but I just couldn't get out of my own way. And so I think what, what had happened is I developed in seeing people get in their own way 
knowing that I wish I had someone like me when I was in that development uh, stage in that formative years to help me just get out of the way of myself so I could play. And so uh, that's kind of the, the biggest uh, quality that I developed um, and was able to kind of dovetail that. And then, then after I stopped playing, because I was just kind of a mess, I just was so frustrated. I just couldn't, like I said, I just couldn't, I couldn't get out of my own way. I, uh, you know what heads or tails. And I started working at Saddlebrook um, and I primarily came in as Jennifer Capriati's hitting partner. And so I hit with Jennifer and then I knew Jim, I hit with Jim Courier and Pete was there. I hit with Pete. And so I was on the court hitting with all these great athletes, but I was also listening to what their coaches were saying. And so a situation would arise and I'd think, okay, I would handle it this way. Let's see how it worked out. And most of the time I was dead wrong, right. but I was able then to say, okay, why was I wrong? What did I miss? And so I was just a sponge. I was, I was very, very fortunate to be in that environment um, and, and be able to learn. Now, it's funny you say that because I, mine was very similar. I actually did. I grew up not really loving tennis. Like I started playing tennis at seven just because it was the only summer camp that was still accepting people mm -hmm. July 27th. Uh, but I wanted to play basketball, play at AAU, play at the YMCA. Um, but then was always more probably cerebral than I was, you know, like into the game. Neither one right. of my parents played tennis. My mother never saw me hit a tennis ball ever in my life. My dad would come to tournaments and sit in the car and finish. My dad was an attorney, so he'd sit in the right. car and write. So I actually had to figure out the game. So I would say the thing that really prevented me from going on was an involved parent. Okay. Right. To know, yeah, the coach is getting stale or the coach is just taking my money and not really trying. Right. You and I know what that looks like. Right. 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 But right. at 13, you may not. Right. But a good involved parent can say, yeah, we need to switch. And I so think, do you think you think you would have been a better player than coach if you had the right environment. I think I would have gone further as a player. Okay. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. I don't okay. ever think I like had the skills to play on tour. I think everyone sort of like every college player plays at the D1 level thinks they could have been better than they are until you get on a court with Steve right. or John or Sloan or Madison. Like, yeah, I was never going to be this good. You know what I mean? I'm right. smart enough to know I was never going to be that, but I think I could have been better if I had had right. more involvement. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. Um, so, but, but no disappointment. I never really had the desire to play. So when I look at, but I always look at the things that held people back, right? Or maybe like could have made a difference and whatever. And that, that what I say was mine. So it struck me when you listen to like, you learning from other coaches, um, you know, and being able to say, how would I handle it? And how would they handle it? Right. Well, I think it's important when you become a coach that you have your own style that you're, that you're comfortable with. And you look at the NFL and you look at the coaching tree, it starts with, you know, whoever at the top, and their assistants go on to become a coaches, head coaches, and then so on. So it's the coaching tree. And so you would take something uh, of, a, of a parcels, but then you would blend it into your, what fits to you and your style and your approach. And then that rubs off on, on your assistants and so on and so forth. And it filters down. And so you take, uh, there's a lot of things from coaches that I like, but I would take it and maybe say it or package it this way because I think that's worked better for me. Right. Now, let me ask you this. So when you first started coaching on tour, where did you feel your biggest growth opportunity was? Like for me, before I started coaching on tour, I was building players. I'm talking about from five years old, I built some, right. a lot of nasty ranked players, a lot of college ship recipients. So I would think my strength was technical. Okay. Right? I could build a player and having built a lot of players allowed me to also know how to break down players, you know, right. strike zones with different right, right, grips, right, right. Mm -hmm. you know, the chicken mm -hmm. wing forehand, like how right. to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say when I got on tour, it was learning when to speak, what not, when not right. to speak, uh, learning how to manage the process, manage the conversation, manage the mental. Right. What do you think when you first started coaching on tour was your biggest growth opportunity? You know, it's interesting. You brought up a great point. There's so many different facets in, in you look at the great players playing on TV. There's so many different stages and development and facets. Um, I, I, I would say my sweet spot 
was being able to look at someone and see and hear how they think. And a negative emotion is the, the number one killer in, in, in tennis. And when you look at a one-on-one -on -one sport, it really is the number one killer. And, and, and there are so many, there's so many negative emotions and fear and whatnot. And, and being able to, so I couldn't stay in the moment, but I know how to get other people to stay in the moment. Cause I know what it feels like not to stay in the moment. Mm -hmm. So I was, I, I was always felt like that was the best that I could do. My, my best first step was to be able to help people compete. Is it, and, and it doesn't matter what happened last point. We're just the most important thing is right now. And so obviously you need the skill set, which you know, your skill set, your, your, your number one skill set would provide in the technical aspect. Uh, but that was where I was able to, 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 to make a first step. And then I would have to learn the other aspects uh, of coaching and helping someone get from A to B um, in the professional ranks. Yeah, and I think when I first got on tour, um, before I started to get access to a lot of the analytics, mm -hmm. right? Um, like that first six months together, Sloan and I were together, you know, the first six months, she won three titles in six months. And it was purely, this was like with no access to analytics yet, right? right? This right. was purely looking at strokes, looking at technique and saying, where does this break down? Right. What part of the court does it break down? What, you know, how high, what type of ball, what ball speed? And I think that purity, like of the brain, mm -hmm. sort of helped me early on. And then you get into the analytics, which made it a little bit easier. But I think mm -hmm. that purity, and I think that after we started winning, that's when the complexity of staying in the moment, not looking ahead, not believing what you read, right? Because some of the mental, I feel like the mental challenge, uh, I mean, obviously, there's mental challenge is coming up in terms of confidence. But in terms of mental challenges of when you are a top 25 player of just sort of continuing to stay on the attack, mm -hmm. right? Not just on the court, but just in your whole approach. That is when I started to sort of have to deal with uh, managing the emotion and staying in the moment, not looking ahead, you know, not worrying about what if I lose this girl, she's 250 in the world. What is the internet going to say now? That's sort of when that came. But first it was like, all right, how we win matches just from a sheer tactical right. standpoint. And then later it became like, all right, now how do we manage all this? You're managing expectations. Yeah. 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 You're managing expectations. And it's not easy. The more success you have, the harder it is to stay successful. Yeah. And there's a lot of other like thoughts that can creep in that are, are not benefit. They're not beneficial. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a full-time job. It's a <laughs> Now, let me say, when I look at your player roster, right, there's three names that sort of stick out, right? I look at John. Mm -hmm. I look at Sam. Mm -hmm. I look at Stevie Johnson. Mm -hmm. When I look at those three players, I see three great Americans. Mm -hmm. Probably a, one or two of them will end up being in the Hall of Fame, right? Definitely John mm -hmm. would probably end up being in the Hall of Fame. But I also see three players that at certain periods of their career were very one-dimensional. Mm -hmm. Like you see, Stevie Johnson had to learn to play around his backhand, mm -hmm. right? Still has a great career. You know, Sam, probably not the most mobile, mm -hmm. still had a great career. Same thing for John, one of the biggest and best serves in the history of the game, probably not seen as somebody that's going to stay in the rally 12, 13, 14 balls. Tell me a little bit about your time with them and how you helped them be successful with those sort of, I want to call it limitations, but styles. Right, sure. So um, with John and Stevie, I I got them fairly early in their in their pro career. Um, and with John, I had the luxury of knowing John for about a year and a half because I, I was working again at Saddlebrook, um, and John was training out of Saddlebrook, but I wasn't working with him. So I had the luxury of watching his practices for a year and a half. And really watching him becoming, we became very, very good friends. And so when, when we started working together, I was able to hit the ground running. And, and my, first, my, my, my first topic was, John, 
I want you to understand how you have the potential to make guys feel. And so in two weeks, we, we, we reorganized his game and, and we came up with big man tennis. And that's where, that's where it came from. Actually, my wife came up with it, play big man tennis. And he was really kind of the first of that mold to really, really play big man tennis. And, um, you know, it's funny because, you know, John came out of school uh, and then about a year later, I started working with him and it was really fun teaching him how to be a professional. I mean, he, he is the consummate professional, uh, but, you know, I have a kind of a funny aha moment story for all of them. And my one with John was you know, we're playing and, you know, John was, is a great competitor, great competitor. Um, but he would let emotion sometimes dictate his decisions. And I remember you playing a tournament in Houston and he was playing Mikey Russell. And I think Mikey Russell broke a serve and he snapped a racket. And after the match, I was like, what are you doing? Like, these guys are good. You know, Prince isn't going to make enough rackets for you to play with every time you get broke. Right. And so, you know, we would, I, w- I was leaning on him pretty hard about move on, move on, let's go. You can't react. Okay. The next point, you can't let one bad point turn into five, not being grumpy. And so it was a constant daily, daily message, a daily message. And so we go to DC and he's playing top 10, uh, Thomas Burdich. And he's up six, three, five, four serving 40, 15 gets broken. He's up six, three in the tiebreaker up seven, six, I think in eight, seven loses the tiebreaker. And then he's down 1540 at one all in the third. And I'm, I'm just like, I don't know what I'm going you know, to When all this is happening, I'm trying to get my post-match speech together, <laughs> get it going. And so then he holds and he wins six, three in the third. And I'll never, ever forget this moment with John. This tumult, this moment to me is, is bigger than the, the 70, 68 at Wimbledon. So I walk in the locker room and I'm standing next to him and he's getting all his gear going. And he sees me right to his, right to his, uh, his side. And he says, never batted an eye, did I see me? And I was like, no, you didn't, congrats. And so to me, just telling that story is chills because as, as coaches, all we want to do is move, move the needle. We want to be the difference. We want to make a difference. Yeah. And so with John at that point, then, then it was like, okay, he knows how to compete from A to Z. There are things that are going to come at him that are going to be great. You stay calm. There are things that are going to come at him that are not going to be great. You manage it, you stay calm. So with John, that, that was, that was kind of my, uh, my, my highlight, my highlight moment with Stevie so I didn't have the luxury of knowing Stevie. Uh, he came out of school and I was with the USTA at that point. And so I had to kind of get to know Stevie pretty quickly. And you know, the, 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 the things I kept on hearing and the reports I kept on hearing were you know, how bad his backhand was, but that weren't, I wasn't hearing the good things. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in human nature, you think what's wrong. So I can remember the moment like it was yesterday. We're in Bordeaux at the Challenger in Bordeaux. And I just had this aha moment. And I said, Stevie, what if we go with the fact that your backhand slice is amazing? I mean, look at Steffi Graf. Let's, let's model after Steffi Graf, okay? She, and Martina, I mean, let's look at the ones that are, 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 have been like world, world, world-class athletes with a slice backhand. And it was really simple, like, I wanted him to hit a really heavy, nasty slice and the guys would lift and give, give the ball air. And then here comes the forehand. Right. So here comes the forehand. And then we encouraged him because he has a really good one-handed backhand. He really should have been a Mm one-hander and the guys, Oh, I'll just approach to that side. Well, here comes the one-hander pass them. And now guys are like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. And so it, it was that moment with Stevie and Bordeaux, your backhand slice is amazing. Let's say it's, ama- it's amazing because it is amazing. So mm-hmm. kind of flipped the script on how we thought about that mind space on that wing. And, and, and um, that 
he got to 21 in the world. He was the number one ranked American for a week, has, has scores of, of, of massive wins. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's an amazing competitor. You don't win 72 matches in a row at the end of your college career. And I mean, that's, that's amazing. 72 yeah. in a row. I mean, I, I don't know if I could do, do anything 72 times in a row. Right. So he had that gene and then now we could I just, just lean on that competitive fire and that competitive spirit. Um, and with Sam, so, so I was, I got, I knew Sam for a long period of time because when I was coaching John, he played doubles with Sam a lot. And so it was David Nankin was the only USTA on the road at that time. So it was Sam and David, John and myself, and we slept all over the world together. So I got to know Sam well. So I had the luxury of hitting the ground running with Sam and Sam is the funniest. I mean, he's like Larry David. I mean, yeah. every day something crazy happens in his life that is like a like a, a TV <laughs> script. It, it's the funniest thing in the world. So, and and Sam is a very docile creature. He's he's very he's very easygoing. Um, he's very soft and well spoken. He's just a very gentle man. Mm -hmm. And I had this. I went on the live one time. We're playing in Acapulco and he's playing, uh, he's playing Kyle Edmund first round. And Sam was kind of getting in his own way, right? And I, I, I took a chance and I said, Sam, and I gave him one of these, like, not another word like that. And I was like, God, I hope I didn't go too hard. And Sam just kind of went like this. And then what happened was he got out of his own way one in the third set. So we go to dinner and Sam and I have a meeting afterwards. And he goes, yeah, I really wasn't happy with myself. I said, I wouldn't either. <laughs> he looks at, like this. And I said, I don't, he plays go fond tomorrow. I don't care if you lose O and O. I don't care. You're going to do this, this, and this. End of discussion. Are we clear? He goes out and beats go fond like two and O. And the two games that he lost, he lost serve. Done bad enough. Mm. So now we have some momentum. And so now I've got his ear. So then the next round, he plays Dominic team. Okay. Listen, you match up well against Dominic. You're going to do this, this, and this. He beats Dominic. Plays um, uh, Kyrgios in the semis. Loses the first set. Um, a little bit sideways, but he writes the ship and wins five and a third. And he plays Roth in the final. And so I go up to, I go up to, and he's had, um, he's had amazing momentum. So I go up to Sam in the pre-match speech and I'm like, Sam, I like the matchup. I like the matchup a lot, actually. I think you're favored. I think, but there are three undeniables that are non-negotiable. Okay. You're non-negotiable A, B, and C. A, B, and C, you'll be in good shape. And Sam was always really good. If he got if he got over the line a little bit, he came good. And he beat Roth in straights. Mm. And he's up 6-4 in the tiebreaker after. And obviously, one of the things you gotta play, you you you, you get a ball, you gotta hit it. I mean, you gotta be aggressive. And so Sam at 6-4 in the tiebreaker, he lets the air out of the ball a little bit, you know. He lets and and uh Rafa makes an error. And so after after in the locker room he goes cb i know the game plan was to be aggressive but i just kind of wanted i said hey man it worked right it worked. congrats and so he had an amazing week but it started from an, a situation where he was starting to get in in his own way and this happens to all of us happens to all of us and so and it's a it's a tool that you get coaches can use but you got to be careful um, I, I don't like using that because I would rather do it with knowledge and understanding. But sometimes, you know, you just got to kind of crack the whip and just, hey, enough's enough. Let's get to work. And it just kind of got Sam from here to here. Yeah. And it was it was an amazing week. It was, a, it was yeah. just an unbelievable week. I feel sometimes, especially with individual sports, with tennis, you got to get their attention off of beating themselves up and have them put it on you. Right? right. And so like when you look at some players who you can clearly see are like yelling at their boxes, even Kyrgios is famous for this. Right. Yelling at their boxes. Danielle Collins, you can see it 
So to have him like, yeah, that's good. That's a good thing. That's like, give it to me, right? right. So you don't beat yourself up and then obviously start tanking from there, right? And we've seen Sam get down on himself and then boom, 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 you know, four or five games quick. Um, but I want to go back to each player. So one of the things okay. in 2018, John Isner won Miami. Yes. And that was the first 1,000 mm-hmm. that he'd ever won, which was shocking to me, right? I was like, a dude on tour this long, this good, this is his first 1,000. Now, for everybody listening, that is not a knock on anybody's career. That is just how good men's tennis is. Right. What do you think the reason is for that? I mean, I think when you look at John now, he's actually pretty damn good from the ground. Yes. I mean, like really good. You know what I mean? You see even guys like Riley who are big guys now who are actually not that bad, you know, from the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think the one thing, if John had had it earlier in his career, would have like given him like one of those larger, bigger titles early on? Well, you know, when we're going through, so John and I stopped in, in 13, at the end of 12. Yeah. And it's really interesting. You know, the media was like, you know, U.S. men's tennis, U.S. men's tennis. And I'm like, I'll give you three words. It's Novak, Rafa, and Roger. <laughs> like, like you're going to have to beat two or three of those guys to win it. And, and it just was. Possible. It's not going to happen. Right. I mean, you might be, but back at that day, like it's not going to happen. And, you know, you and I were talking beforehand, you know, the matches that you should have won uh, or, or you, you said, what are the matches you won that you should have? And we're like, dude, I only remember the matches we should have won that right. didn't happen. And, and going to your point, uh, John, we're playing in bear C one of the years I was coaching him and he's playing, um, he's playing in the semis and he's playing Sangha in the semis. And John's got match point second serve in the semis to play Roger. And, you know, at that time, Roger's back could have gone out at any time. Right, right. Um, and so second serve, and I'm telling you, Songa hit a 67 mile an hour second serve. I don't know how it landed in. Ended up, ended up, John ended up losing. Right. So, you know, one of those, that falls, that falls in. I mean, that falls our way. And he's Roger in the final. And, you know, Roger doesn't really enjoy returning John's serve. I don't know many people that do. Yeah. But indoors with that, I mean, we got a chat. We have a chance. It's funny you say that. Roger actually, a lot of people don't know that. Roger can get rattled when you serve big at him and he doesn't, like, get a read on it in, like, the first three quarters of the set. You know what I mean? He gets a little rattled with big servers. Well, the, you know, no, everyone, those three are, are amazing and have different skill set. But, yeah. you know, Novak, it's coming back. Yeah. Rafa's going to go in the first row to return and right. he'll eventually find a way. You know, Rogers, Roger, I wouldn't put Roger, you know, Roger gets a lot of balls back in play, but his return isn't the central piece of his game, say like Novak. Yeah. And so that way it, it kind of evens the, the field for John. Yeah. So, you know, that was one off the top of my head where it was, it was a great week, it, it, but man, I sure would have liked to have tried to game plan against Roger in the final. <laughs> it was either 10 or 11. So, you know, they could have, it could have come, it could have come seven, eight years beforehand. It's just the margins and these guys were so good. And it just, you know, the decision between a, a match winning or losing is it could be, you know, someone, an act of God or things. Someone misses a call. Someone gets yeah. a first serve. Someone gets the let cord. It's just not anything you can game plan and, and not anything really you can, you, you can describe or, or define. You know, it's funny you say that because as a coach, win or lose, there's certain matches you want to be a part of. You want to be a part of any match where you're coaching the player playing against one of the big three. Mm-hmm. So I know in the semis, you look like this would just be great to be able to coach against the guy, yep. right? Uh, and I remember it was one year at Wimbledon Sloan, second round playing Kuznetsova was like up like 5 4 40 love in the second, end up splitting, then up like should have won the third to play Serena. And that was the year Serena almost lost to Christina McHale in the first round. Right. Mm-hmm. Remember that? I was yeah. like, oh, yeah. So I started like looking. I'm like, so, you know, you're sitting there, we're at court one, court one. 
and they have like the scoreboard on the opposite 45 degrees from the player's chair and right. they flashed the score of Serena just won and you saw the message going I was like and I got excited but you see the player start to yeah yeah, 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 yeah. right and yeah. that was one where I was like damn that'd be I just love to be able to play against her right uh, but let's go to Stevie so when I think okay. about Steve Johnson right I think about you talking about Steve Slice and I say you know, back court, the cross court rally with Steve. The moment he takes that backhand slice to your forehand, and you take that forehand cross court, points over. Is that like Steve Johnson's sort of signature play? Because I feel like once he chips to your forehand, you're done. It's over. So there's a couple of things with Stevie. Um, one, the first thing I always wanted to know when game planning, when I was working with Stevie is how are they going to handle the slice? And some handled it better than others. Um, some, it didn't matter. It came back hard, uh, firm, deep. And others, if they tried to slice, if they just put a little bit of air under it, or like you said, they would try to slice line to, to Stevie. Stevie has the most unbelievable wrist I've ever seen. He can bend the ball and get the ball up and down and around. I mean, he can do things with his hand and wrist I've never seen, ever seen. He works the ball yes. so much with that forehand. So it was then, like you said, prior, can he get the ball up high? So he can keep the ball low with the backhand, and then the ball, the forehand jumps, and it's up high and out of the pocket. And then Stevie's got a unbelievable kick serve and a very 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 good first serve and so it was it was more of uh like with john and sam it could be like heavyweight boxing i'm not moving i'm just gonna swing because i can you know stevie it was more like he has the roundhouse but he did need to move and set the play up yep. a little bit more for him but when we started thinking in those terms then it became it, it became a lot of fun. And I just, I loved watching guys would go back to their box and, and, and just start like, what is going on? Like what is going, because if you've never seen and played against Stevie slice, you, you don't know how to handle it. Cause you better be able to handle it. So what happened was the court got smaller mm -hmm. because if, if for, and Stevie's court got bigger because he could bend the ball. Mm -hmm. And so then it was just kind of tilting the percentage is Stevie's way. Now, the, tr the trouble also was if someone was able to take that slice and go big, go big back and right. not be affected. Okay, well then now we've got we to work on a couple other areas right. to, to, get that, uh, to get that percentage back in our, in, our, in, our, uh, in our favor. But that's where coaching and game planning and talking about, uh, talking about plan A, play, play A, play B. If they go here, do this. That's when it becomes like, like yeah. a chess match. A lot Stevie's fun. fun in that way. He's, yeah, fun in that, that, yeah. he's yeah. perfect yeah. for like that. Perfect Because like with Sam, Sam was pretty like pretty yeah. downhill. Ball. downhill. And I was like, Sam, I don't care if you're hitting it to the wrong part of the court, as long as you commit to hit it. Cause yeah. his game was so big. Yeah. So like if the guy's backhand was twice as good and, and the ball was there for the, to, to hit, I was, hey, we're testing our dog just came. Um, I'd say, just go to the back end. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about going to, you, you do what you do best. Yeah. So that was, that was kind of the difference between the two, a, a little bit of the differences. And the one thing too, is I think Steve, one of his gifts, I remember like uh, the COVID year, we had world team tennis. That was the first time I got to be like on the court coaching against Steve. And I remember him talking, playing the game and narrating the game as he played it, right? And he was playing Brandon Akashima, who we all know is a stud. Right. And when I said he just talked this boy out of the match, you know, crossing over, like, come out. You're going to have him search my forehand every first point of every game. You know, it's just like he would just tell you. Right. He would let you know that he knows what's happening. Right. And he would, like, make it fun. And he would, like, sort of, like, screw with you and the one like brandon don't talk to him brandon don't look at him brandon don't laugh at his jokes because he's just like winning the match by being able to play and still sort of have a personality where sam is kind of like more like you know when he's playing he's like playing right he's right. not really talking right. to anybody right right, right where stevie's right. kind of like yeah i'm aware of what's happening i'm having fun i'm gonna with you a little bit you know right. what i mean yeah yeah well i mean 
he's SC boy in in those SC UCLA matches. I mean, he he was a college boy at heart. And Stevie is he is a, a tennis player looking for a team. That Peter Smith told me that. Yeah. Like he he needs a team. He needs yeah. to play. He's much better playing for some you know the name on the front more than the name on the back. Yeah. And so when you put T, uh, Stevie on a team, then he has the responsibility of others. And he he come on, I'll carry you. And he has he has that personality. Uh, and you know Stevie was both Stevie and Sam. Like like I coached both those guys at the same time for a few years, and it doesn't happen unless they're people like Stevie and Sam. They both yeah. love each other. They're both insanely respectful of each other. Um, and, and it starts and stops there. If you don't have that, then you can't really do too well or do too for a number of years. And that now just- Now, let me ask you that because, you know, we don't see it that often where you see players split coaches. You see it more on the guy side, less on the WTA. Is it, I mean, now they make so much money, it shouldn't be financial. Is it financial? Is it, hey, I got to practice with another guy anyway, or we play almost the exact same schedule anyway, uh, or I don't really need somebody to do everything for me. I just need them there when I need them. So it makes sense for me to split. Like, how does that work and how did it start? Well, well, the reasons that you said, it could be all of those. Mm -hmm. Or um, it, it started... How did it start? I was coaching Stevie. I, I was out. I was coaching Stevie privately. And I think Sam had approached Stevie to say, hey, look, would you mind considering this? And like you said, they played the same schedule. Um, they're both fairly independent. They don't need hand holding all day. Yeah. Um, it, cut, uh, it cut the expenses in half. So that was financially easy. Um, it was kind of a team, like Stevie needs a team. Like I said, Stevie wants a team. They play doubles together a lot. They shared Christian Lacasio as a physio who's amazing. Yeah. I mean, we had an amazing team for three years. Amazing. Christian is as good as it gets. Christian and I work together as good as it gets. Sam and Stevie are as good as it gets as people. Mm -hmm we just had an absolute blast. They were, there were the few times where one of the players went left and one went right. It was all organized. It was everything's done up at front. Um, it, it just worked. I mean, they, and then I never had them hit together because I, I wanted them to think that for the time that I was with them, they had a full-time guy. Mm -hmm. So the only time that we would hit together is like, if we did a trip to Asia and we got there at the same time and they just wanted a quick hit. Yeah, it's like we're not going to work on anything here except get the leg, get the trip out of the legs. Right. Um, I mean, it's just it was really golden. I, 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 you know, I see Christian and we just look back and some of the some of the some of the memories we had together. Sam, back to back years, beat the number one player in the world at, at Wimby, the top seed. He beat Novak, then he beat Murray. Um, you know, it's just so, some of the moments that we, we share, you know, Stevie, the year Stevie made round of 16 and Sam made quarters at Wimby and I'm running back and forth between wow. the courts, you know, it's just, it's just magical years. I just, I, I just, I, I wouldn't have trade the, the, those years for anything. I was, it was, it was sad when it came to an end, but everything has got to come to an end. But, um, I look back on the very, very, very fondly. Not only are those times, but the guys that that uh, I was able and fortunate to share that those that uh, those times with. So you look above your shoulder there, and you see all the credentials, right? I, I and I've like made a habit of saving my one day. I'm gonna frame them, there they right? Are. Um, and I have like favorite stops on tour. Some that's like, yeah, whatever. It's in the middle of a schedule. We got to go, right? And some that are like, you sure you're not injured? Maybe we should go, <laughs> right? Um, tell me some of the, and as a coach, you look at it differently, right? You know, the player like, oh, I can't wait to go here and go to my favorite restaurant. Right. right? right, right. Me, you look at it like, all right, I got to manage this whole thing. You know what I mean? Tell me what, like, what tournament do you, what's your favorite stop on tour? You know, slam. I would slam favorite slam. Okay. Favorite slam. Um, you know, I'm not going to sidestep this question. This is the God's honest truth. For whatever reason, 
early on my career, I always picked something I loved about every tournament and was excited to go to that tournament for that reason. And you can pick a tournament and I could tell you why Toronto, Carl Hale loved, I love the tournament. Love him. love him. Montreal, unbelievable vegan restaurant called love. Yeah. Uh, Hubie's vegan. So You've been to Milos in Montreal, Milos, the Greek restaurant. Woo. Well, is it vegan? No. Oh, you're yeah. vegan. Hubie's vegan. Got it. Hubie's vegan. Mm. Um, so, I mean, Australian Open, Craig Tiley. I mean, the guy's a, the guy's a legend. Right. Uh, it's Australia. Australia, the people there are amazing. It's the summer there. The crown. The, the, <laughs> the crown. The crown. Uh, uh, unbelievable atmosphere playing. Um, now ATP Cup in Sydney, you know, with uh, with Hubie playing and the Poland team, Poland, who very tight knit group. Um, you've I I I enjoy the French because I think the French is one of the easiest to prepare with Jean Bois off site. You don't even need to go on site. You can get two hours there if you if you need. I, I mean, everything's there. It's it's really easy to prepare. It's Paris. I mean, come on. It's great. Right. Um, Wimbledon, we stay, we stay in the village in a flat. This is the only tournament in the world where you don't really stay in a hotel per se. Right. I mean, you can maybe do that in Indian Wells. Um, and then the open. I mean, who doesn't, I mean, you might not like New York, but it's chaotic, but for two and a half weeks, it's a great place to visit. Right. I think it's a great place to visit. Logistically, it can be tough with the traffic and and things of that of that nature, and that's a probably the hardest one to manage in terms of, of things outside of tennis. But it's New York. I mean, it's you 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 can feel the energy. You can feel it. It's New York. It's come off. Forget about it. You know. I mean, right. we're on our way to the. I mean, in in the U.S. Open, it's more than a tennis tournament. It's an event. The way yeah. they put it on. It's a, a spectacle to go and, and watch. It's so entertaining. So, and then obviously Indian Wells, everyone loves Indian Wells. Miami, like a lot of, you either love Indian Wells, you hate Miami, you love Miami, you hate Indian Wells, but you know, James Blake's the tournament director. I mean, James is the, you don't like James Blake, you don't like people. I mean, he's the greatest guy around. I, mean, I love James. I have, I was, you know, I got to work with James for a bit of time. He was amazing. Plus also Hubie won Miami. Mm. So, you know, you name a tournament and I could I could tell you something positive about that tournament that I'm looking forward to going. Plus, I love what I love is every week is different. There's something different. And I've got to figure out what difference I can make to counteract that difference. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how my mind and my brain thinks um, getting on a plane and being able to, you know, do what I've done for so long. And look, it hadn't been easy when the kids were young to, to see the kids at the door, you know, waving by and daddy's got to go on a plane. But, uh, you know, my wife played, she played all four years at Stanford and graduated from Stanford and won the NCAA titles four years in a row. And she, I think she's got the dual match record uh, percentage wise at Stanford. So she got it and she was the glue and she was able to, I would communicate to her and then she would communicate to the kids. And, and now with, with streaming and look, my daughter designs all my Selenko gear and she texts me the outfit that she wants me to wear for that day. So when she sees dad on TV, she's a part of it. She's like, I picked that and designed that outfit. Mm -hmm. And they love that dad's on TV and my family loves Hubie. He's, he's my, my daughter's like, he's, he's my fourth child now. And so he's, he's part of the family. So it's been kind of a family uh, undertaking for 30 some odd years. And that's how I've been able to kind of move through the years and get all gray here and you know, be able to, to love what I do. And to, I'm excited tomorrow to get on the plane to go to DC like it would be my first tournament. So you're talking about Hubie. So Hubie Hurtcott. So um probably the only non-American player the that, non that I, the that only. I, yeah, that I've seen you coach. Uh, tell us about him. Cause when I look at him, when I first saw him years ago, I sort of looked at him like a Sam, like hits the ball. Well, really quiet, a little bit in his head on head. Mm -hmm. Doesn't appear to be that mobile at first glance, <laughs> right? At first glance. Right. 
Right. But I think all of those things are wrong. Now. So, so let me tell you a funny story. Um, he's deceptively athletic. Yeah. So Hubie just, he won Holly um, a few weeks ago before Wimby. And in the semis, he played, he played Nick, curious. And Hubie, the first game, Hubie serving 15 love and Nick gets Hubie on his horse, like left, right, left, right, left, right. And Hubie's sliding open stance and Hubie won the point. Nick, <laughs> Nick comes back to me. I'm on the same side as him. He goes, big fella can move. Yeah. <laughs> Big fella can move. Right. He's deceptively athletic. Yes. Yep. Yes. Decept. So uh, Hubie is, he's one of these guys that is easy. Pigeon to toe. So he's pigeon toe. Oh, that's yeah. What, oh, yeah. That's oh, what yeah. makes him look, you know, you don't yeah, see a yeah. lot of pigeon toe people that can move. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. That's what throws you off a little bit. Right. Yep. Yeah. He, um, he is the type by the nature, by, like you said, being kind of low key, mild mannered. He's easy to overlook. Okay, you he doesn't have a shot that like you look at Chapo or you look at Felix or you look at Sinner or you look at Alcaraz, you know, they're like the wall, like wow. Right. But if you ask anybody that's played Hubie, they'll be like, wow, yeah. his ball's heavy, he's athletic, he's got a very good serve, ma makes almost every return, um, good touch, can't get the ball past him, uh, very good intangibles unbelievable backhand can redirect he's got he's got the full package of just about everything that you'd want but he's not necessarily a massive sizzle right but who cares about sizzle yeah i don't yeah. you know it's sizzle <coughs> tournament winning the tally that's right. sizzle. Yeah. but you know you you talk to nick and and you talk to the guys and Everybody loves Hubie. He's the nicest guy in tour, but they respect how good a player he is. Yeah. And that, that, that to me, that to me is the ultimate respect. Yeah. And you look at him and you think that, wow, when the big three move on, this will be a guy, I mean, on the men's tour, they're all going to share titles, right? I mean, okay. there's probably not going to be one that dominates like the big three. Have. You got Alcaraz now, you got Nick. I mean, Remove the big three from Tim. I mean, Nick Kyrgios would be a totally different type of player without yeah. those three, right? Yeah. Uh, but Hubie's one of those guys that I think when the big three move on, he could win three or four titles a year. You know, if not. Yeah. More. I mean, I mean, I think what you're going to have a list of about 12 to 15 that could win a slam. Yeah. You're going to, in that list, you're going to have probably four that probably will win it. And then another four that really, really could win it very easily, given the things that fall. Yeah. And and so within that, I think that's why it's going to be kind of fun to see, you know, who comes good, uh, who comes good this week or who comes good this slam or what's going on. So it's a it's a fun time to be on the inside of it. I mean, everyone loves Roger, Rafa and Novak, but oh my goodness, they're not human. Are they human? Are they still human? I mean, they're going to have to retire at some point, some point right? Right, it's exactly. Simple. So, um, and so then it's just, let's see who is able to fill those shoes and who's comfortable filling those shoes. And one of those things I do, I, I, like I start to look ahead to what's next is I remove the slams. Mm -hmm. And I look at the 1000s, right? I look at the 500s and you see who's winning those. And then you can say, okay, when these guys move out the way, and you who one of those, right? We talked right. about how he's one of those where uh, my was it in Miami, Indian Wells, he won. He won Miami. Miami. So yep. you start to look at those, like, okay. He's one of those guys, right? Because you, you know, one thousands, maybe they are not playing for one reason or another, or don't make it there, or whatever. They slip out of the draw. And those guys that emerge there are the ones that you add to that 12 to 15 list mm -hmm. of Grand Slam contenders mm -hmm. once they move on. And I think. Three years ago, maybe Hubie wasn't on that list, but I think no, 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 no. Yeah. now he for sure is. Like, I, you know, you don't want to play an inform Hubie. You, you just don't. I mean, if he's in form and he's free, he's trying to get like a nickname for him. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you are just a menace. Right. And he's like, menace is kind of negative, but I'm saying, I'm saying it in the most loving way. Right, right, right. Like, he's a menace to deal with.
Yeah. He can cover like a he can cover like Mev, maybe no, like Medvedev ish. Yeah. On the cover, right? You know what I mean? Really, really good. Very good. Very good. So let me take you to the US Open this year, right? A lot of conversation about Novak, the mm-hmm. COVID rule. Mm-hmm. What do you think? I think that when you look at Australia this year, you know, what happened there, you think about the financial impact of what it means to be the all-time leader in Grand Slams between the three. Mm -hmm. There's probably with endorsement deals, bonuses, it's probably a hundred million dollar impact to one of those guys with these decisions Mm -hmm. related to COVID. Mm -hmm. What do you think will happen to the U.S. Open? Well, I, I can only hope that he can play. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I hope they can figure something out where he can play, but then they've been pretty consistent in that area with you know the nets and the players and basketball players and whatnot. Yeah. But I'm just talking about just from a, a, a sheer tennis standpoint, he's a tennis player. So let him play tennis for his living. Let him do that. Now, what happens is there's like obviously the government this is not an issue other than the government. You know, what happened in Australia was an absolute crime. I mean, it was, I, I was a little disappointed ATP wasn't as vocal about that as they were about Wimbledon because Aussie let him in the country. Okay, if you don't let him in the country, fine. But they let him in the country and then they kicked him out. I just, I mean, that's just not, that, that wasn't the right move uh, in my opinion. Um, and now, He's not going to have Australia. He won Wimby with no points. He's not going to have the U.S. Open. He's not allowed to play in Montreal. I mean, he's going to be 20 in the world. Mm. I mean, I'm I'm exaggerating, but like he could easily, I mean, what's he going to do? The ATP did not fill the one, the uh, Shanghai. So that's another thousand uh, winner points off the schedule. Um, it was a bunch of two fifties and they, they filled one week with a 500. So after the open, which he won't be able to play, I don't know how he catches up. You well, know, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about that. And I think about it a lot. I think, you know, given Rafa's time seems like just health wise, body wise, seems to be winding down more than Novak Roger, same thing. I think that eventually Novak passes Rafa just because physically he looks like he has another two years in it you know of health and life yeah yeah you know what I mean yeah Yeah, I agree agree. even with even with this year this impact I still think he ends up being the all-time leader because just magically he just still looks like he has three or four years in him Mm -hmm. you know when you bring up a great point I'm sure in his inner circle that that is a voice and what you're voicing right now is we're going to play the long game we're going to play the long game you know let's i applaud uh novak for standing on his principle what he feels is right um i just think it's a shame for tennis like even if like novak were going to go and beat hubie at the open that's okay he's one in the world he's like you said he's he should be there like let us give let us have a chance to game plan against probably like you said going to end up be the all-time all-time uh greatest player that ever played yeah so that's just kind of my like holistic view of it i just wish he, hope he can play i hope things change where he can play yeah well craig this has been uh you've been generous with your time we know you got to pack and get ready to go to dc uh dc is an interesting tournament because it's quaint right great city Mm-hmm. great placement on the schedule, great nightlife, great restaurants, and they always get good guys. What's your feeling on D.C.? To me, that's like the hidden gem when they had, they had the women's back this year. But when right. they had, the, you know, when the women's was there, that was a place I always liked to go. And Mark is great. Yeah. Um, how do you, what do you think about D.C.? It, it's a very intimate setting. So, and it's, it's a big tournament, but it's got a kind of a laid back feel about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a great, like you said, very historical city, obviously lots of good food. Um, good news is I don't have to drive cause I get lost there all the time when I'm, when I'm driving <laughs> the circles, um, circles. It, but you know, it's a, it, it's, it's, it's a stop that I, I went there often with when coaching the boys, um, Hubie played Olympics last year. So we missed it. 
um, my daughter's birthday, who's going to be there. It's that week. So there's a lot of, a lot of personal things for me. I, I, I do remember that moment with John that was in DC. Yeah. So man, just a lot of, a lot of good, good memories. The, the, the staff that works there is, is very fun and, and easygoing and polite. The only thing you got to dodge there, as you know, is the rain. Oh. If we have good weather, yeah, it's it's outstanding. The with the rain, we can have matches finished two, three in the morning, which is no fault of theirs. Right. So if we have good weather. Oh, it's a it's a gr- unbelievable tournament. Unbelievable it's style. Humid as hell. Humid. Um, well, that's yeah. You get a lot of humidity. Here come the yeah. boomers at night. Now, last question. So I've got a daughter seventeen. I got a boy that's five and a boy that's seven. And I always ask Nick Taviano's question. Rick Macy, do your kids play? My kids do play. So my son um, is a pitcher, uh, college pitcher. Um, he loves to play tennis, but right now it's more the development. So he's not going to do anything right now except working on his craft. My oldest daughter, Sydney, she plays. Uh, she actually plays a lot with my son, Spencer. They go out and hit for a couple of hours. My middle child, Skylar, is in. She just joined USTA about six months ago playing for our development and she hasn't lost a match and she is the thinker. She's the one that figures it out. Uh, and, and tennis has been amazing for her being able to pick it up. She, the, the contacts and the friendships that she has, the exercise that she gets, the competition, the USTA setting up leagues. She's going to, her team is going to the playoffs at Lake Nona. So it's, it's been great. It's been amazing to watch her kind of, uh, kind of come out of her cocoon a little bit. And it's all because uh, of tennis and her being able to play tennis, but they never, they, my girls played softball in high school, so they never played formative tennis, but they play rec- uh, recreationally. Yeah. And I always find it interesting that like really good coaches who coach at the highest level, you know, Brian Shelton is great, right? He's great. Example of, oh man, his, his kid's doing it, right? And they're probably right. sharing that. But I look at the majority of the coaches, we look at their kids are like nowhere near, I mean, my kids, nowhere near what you would expect with the access. And you, I kind of find that my kids go the opposite direction. Okay. Well, you know, it speaks to you as a parent because same with us, we let our kids make their choice. We didn't care what they did as long as they were going to commit to it and have fun and be a good teammate. Mm-hmm. And I remember my daughter, I'm like, Sydney, what do you want to do? I want to play softball. Okay, well, what do you want to do? Mm, I don't know. I'll pitch because the pitcher has the ball every every play. <laughs> Fitter personality. Yeah. Okay. So then then you work towards that. But I mean, it's just kind of a that's what you know a good parent would do is you know, let the children find their their path. And it always kind of comes back to you. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. We wish you luck. We we really appreciate your insights. Great stories about John, Sam, Stevie, uh, and Hubie is, you know, a lot of credit, you know, goes your way to his development. Cause I think years ago, it was like, ah, he's good. He's this, he's that. And now we're like, damn, he can play. And I think every <laughs> player is kind of like left the match saying, oh yeah, he's, he can play. Right. Um, so we wish you a lot of luck. Congratulations on a great career, man. And keep going. Thank you, my friend. And again, I apologize. I'll never ask you for Sloan's brother again. <laughs> John wished he looked as good as yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, we all do. We all do. Believe me. We all do. Well, thank, thank you, buddy. You. Thank you for your time. Thanks thank for having you. me. This has been the Tennis.com podcast with the legendary co- coach, Craig Boyd. Thank you.